we have seen how the earliest temples started off as divine shelters. But the idea of Vedic sacrifice, which is an idea in which you have sacrificial altars, also needed to be reconciled with these divine shelters that were being built for Jain, Buddhist and Hindu deities. Thus, shelters had to be combined with sacrifices and also with worship of stones and trees. In early Buddhist reliefs, you do see a combination of shelters with trees that are enclosed within the shelter. Somewhere the idea that there is a strong vertical axis that needs to be sheltered or enclosed within a hut-like structure was a strong paradigm. In fact, much later in the uh, Jain image at Karkela in North Karnataka, you see a similar idea where a vertical Jain Tirthankara Mahavira in this case is enclosed completely by a set of walls. He represents a cosmic axis which has to be sheltered but because the axis transcends any physical bounds, there is no roof over him. Animistic practices of worshipping stones were prevalent in India before temple Hinduism comes into being. You either have Vedic sacrifice on one hand or this kind of stone worship on the other. Stones with magical properties, magical in terms of their physical appearance, were prized. Highly polished stones from riverbanks, shaligrams or shivalingas were all cherished, put in pedestals and worshipped. These stones, which were often longitudinal, were set in bases called yonis. The linga and the yoni, one set of meanings of which would mean the sexual organs of a male and female principle, were worshipped as a set. It is what you see at the bottom right in the shape of those shivalingas. You have lingas or linga stones being worshipped not only as stones but also in wooden form at times as we see in the image on the top left where you have lingas from Nepal, very clearly phallic in their manifestation. In fact, even natural linga forms such as the one at Ambarnath formed by a natural process of icicles melting every year are worshipped and considered holy by Hindus. But it was this an iconic linga form, this principle of creation, this stone, this phallic object, this column, this axis mundi, which became manifest as a deity, as an anthropomorphic form very early in Hindu mythology. In fact, if you look at various kinds of reliefs, these two are from the caves at Elora on your left and from uh, the temple, the Brihadeshwara temple on the right, you see that this cosmic axis is seen as the unmanifest principle within which an anthropomorphic deity resides. So in both cases you have Shiva emerging from this raw linga form. In the picture on the left you can see very clearly that on the top right you have Brahma trying to find the top of this column flying up to the heavens and at the bottom left you have Vishnu in the Varaha avatar trying to find the bottom of this column going into the murky depths, the muddy waters and which is why he has the Varaha avatar. And the, this axis which is infinite you cannot find the bottom nor the top and therefore this is the principle of creation, this is the axis that needs to be worshipped. And this can only be manifest in anthropomorphic form as Shiva bursts through. The Arupa 
form of Shiva becomes the Rupa form of Shiva. At the famous Shiva found at Parel in Bombay, you see this principle of manifestation explicitly, where the Shiva in the form as Sada Shiva is one in which an axis is maintained, but in every direction Shiva is being manifest. We shall see later that this imagery is not limited to Shaivism, but you also have images of Vishnu which are similar, where you have Vishnu along one axis starting off as a single anthropomorphic image, but really expanding to fill up the whole universe beyond. In fact, Buddhism will also pick up on this iconography as we have seen in the caves at Ajanta, where Buddha multiplies to fill up entire spaces. In fact, some of the early lingas start showing this kind of face to suggest that an aniconic linga will become manifest as a deity in all directions. In fact, through time, if you trace these lingas, from one face you start having multiple faces being manifest in all directions. And this really is the principle of temple Hinduism where a point which is marked by uh, the sanctum really is to be understood as a big vertical axis which will manifest itself in all directions as we have seen in the early temple at Devgad, where a single deity starts manifesting itself on the four walls of the temple sanctum and then eventually the sanctum will multiply and unfold in all directions so that you have a multiplicity of deities on all the walls. Here is an example of how in a two-dimensional space, this single point, this Kendra Bindu, this center of the sanctum will manifest and spread itself in all directions. This is from 16th century Vijayanagar where votive lingas are carved by devotees of Shiva. But just like you have one point expanding to fill up a horizontal space, you have this one point expanding vertically to make an axis and fill up the third axis as well. Again, very early you start seeing manifestations of such lingas both at uh, Mathura but also in various contexts where you have sacrificial posts like the Yupas you see on the right hand side being understood as marking certain kinds of divine axes in themselves. So while the sacrificial altar is marked by a square area, by a horizontal area, this vertical axis also needs to be marked and the temple form will reconcile these ideas of a sacrificial post, of a tree that needs to be worshipped, of a phallic imagery which marks a vertical axis of worship, of a square altar that marks an area where a sacrifice needs to be performed and of course also as a shelter for divinity. All these ideas will come together and form the basis of what becomes the Hindu temple. And therefore if you understand a later Hindu temple as nothing but a marker of this cosmic axis, you will see it's not a far step to understand a temple as a sheath which houses this axis. If one remembers the Mauryan columns that we've seen before with animal capitals on tops, they too are space markers and this idea that a vertical pillar marks a divine axis becomes manifest in a Hindu temple. And therefore the temple on top which is from the 7th century CE and the column at the bottom which is a Buddhist imperial column from the 3rd century BCE do share the same idea of controlling space by marking vertical axes. It is just that the column over time has been completely enclosed by a shelter that houses some form of divinity. And therefore, if you look at the first proto-shrines at sites like Udaigiri, which you see on the left hand side, 
all you have is a cave with a porch in front, the porch consisting of no more than four pillars and a small portico roof. You move from Udaigiri to Sanchi where you have Temple 17 where the cave is now replaced by an artificial constructed cave, a cube which represents a cave inside a hill in front of which you have a portico. And from there within 600 years you move to something like Khajuraho which is essentially the same idea of a sanctum cave with a portico in front but now what you have is the tremendous vertical axis which is also represented this axis being a column that represents a form of divinity taking you right up to the heavens it ties in with the Vedic idea then that you sacrifice into a sacrificial altar the column of smoke that rises takes your sacrifice directly to the gods in this case this vertical axis connects you with divinity directly right on top of this temple at Khajuraho you see this ribbed flattened dome something called an Amalaka which we will talk about shortly. This idea of building some kind of tower is not completely new because you see it in the Kumrahar plate of the 3rd century but you also see it first in the Buddhist temple at Bodh Gaya which is represented in that Kumrahar plate. What you do see at cave sites before are these multi-storied mansions which are represented on the insides of the caves. But to have multi-storied mansions as freestanding structures, you really have it with early Buddhist sites and representations of those sites. The Vedic texts contained a very important set of texts called the Shulba Sutras, which were sacrificial manuals that taught people how to build sacrificial altars on which you could sacrifice for gods above. And the whole earth was thought of as an altar but you had to demarcate a space which was described in the Shulba Sutras. In many ways these cave sanctums which house divinities were thought of as these marked spots where you worshipped and you sacrificed. The, the cave at Udaigiri which does this was replicated completely in built form at Sanchi just about 50 years later. You have Mandapika shrines in central India which take this idea even further and what you see in the Mandapika shrine on the left is nothing but a sacrificial altar, a square altar which has four columns that support a roof on top and the roof on top is also in the form of a sacrificial altar. The altar at the bottom is called a Vedi and the model of an altar on the roof is called an Uttar Vedi. This idea that the sacrificial altar on which you have your object of worship is replicated right on top at the roof line never goes away and you will see in later temples such as the one at Alampur on your top right where you have these dentils marking the Uttar Vedi on top just below the Amlaka. But from there it's a big leap to the age of great temples and this is an age from the 7th, 6th, 7th century onwards till about the 12th, 13th century where these ideas of manifestation of divinity in all directions assumes proportions never really seen before. And the three large remnant extant examples we have of great temples are the Brihadeshwara temple built in 1010 at Tanjavur the Lingaraj temple in Bhubaneswar and the Kandariya Mahadev temple built at Khajuraho in 1025. Remember all these temples are built within a few decades of each other. All of them exhibit slightly different forms but the basic principle is the same. They enclose a square sacrificial altar in the middle of which is an object of worship that is divine this object represents a vertical axis which has to be marked by a model of a multi-storied mansion culminating on top in either a hut or an amlaka and from there your prayers reach the devlok right on top. In front of all these sancta are big sabha mandapas 
in which various activities pertaining to worship might be carried out. The idea that this shikhara, the superstructure, has to manifest a multiplicity in all directions to represent the great manifestation of the divine is also not forgotten. But take a step before and we have a couple of temples which are not freestanding temples of this great age but proto temples such as the great temple at Elephanta in the 6th century CE. And this is a temple that has all the characteristics of the great temples that we see later except one difference in that it is built inside a cave and it is not a freestanding object. But note that the temple of Elephanta has two different axes on which you see two different things. One of which is a ritual axis on which you have at the end a small hut-like structure within which is a shivalinga. This represents the unmanifest form of the divine. And that is the axis you see on top which goes from east to west. At the bottom you see the other axis which goes from north to south and along that axis all you see at the end is this great Trimurti, this great manifestation of Shiva arising out of the rock. And so depending on your mode of worship you would either move from east to west worshipping the Shivalinga housed inside a small shrine or you would move from north to south looking at this great image of Shiva as it's manifesting itself from the living rock. And so these two manifestations of Shiva are a point that is at the cusp of moving from cave temples to freestanding temples. Here you have both modes of worship along two axes and while the temple is inside a cave it starts exhibiting many of the properties that freestanding temples have. And one of the most important of these properties is this idea that the deity who is enshrined inside the temple will manifest himself or herself on the walls of the temple. This is not a freestanding temple so the only walls on which this deity can be manifest are the internal walls of the cave. And how that is done we shall see now. If you look at the mandapa, this big hall which leads you along two axes to the Shivalinga and to the Mahadeva, you see in the corners of this hall various depictions of episodes from the life cycle of Shiva. If this was a freestanding temple, all these manifestations would have been exhibited on the outside of the temple. Because this is a cave, they are all exhibited on the inside. How do we get to this kind of cave temple from the simple caves that represent huts that we saw very early on? Where is the connection between this and the great temple at Elephanta? If one remembers the cave at Barabar, all it is is a long cave with a hut-like structure at one end in which a holy presence marking the divine would reside. You then had Buddhist caves in which you had a hut that would house a stupa inside. The stupa of course indicating the presence of a holy man, in this case the Buddha. How do we move from there to these simple hut-like shrines in which some kind of divine object, divine idol or divine presence was to be venerated? This is where we are where you start having instead of caves, freestanding buildings in which the divine is actually housed. This is just the next step up from a cave carved inside a hut. Here instead you have a freestanding building inside which is carved a cave, the sanctum being a cave in this case. And this idea that divinity manifests itself in all directions as we saw with the Shiva at Parel. You also see the Samlaji Vishnu who does the same thing. Vishnu when he manifests himself expands to fill up the whole universe. Shiva when he arises from a Shivalinga expands along an axis vertically and then outwards to fill up the whole universe. 
and a temple which marks a square piece of ground and then a vertical axis also expands in all directions to fill up the whole universe. And as a temple fills up the universe, you move from this divine axis to more mundane and profane worlds. And therefore, on the outsides of temples, at the very bottoms, at the very outside margins, you see scenes of daily life. The kinds of temples that you have in India can be broadly divided into two types, Latina temples and Kutina temples. And let's look at Latina temples first. Latina temples, commonly called the North Indian temple, are common from Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh onwards into most of North India. They can be characterized by having right on top an amlaka, this ribbed solid dome, below which is a small sacrificial altar called the Uttar Vedi. The Uttar Vedi is a miniature version of the Vedi, which is at the bottom of the Shikhara or of this temple spire. The Amlaka can be seen very early in Buddhist caves, like the one at Bedsa that you see on your top left. But the Vedi is also borrowing very heavily from Buddhist uh, stools, pedestals and altars, such as the ones you see at Gaya. In between the altar at the bottom and the altar at the top is a multi-storied mansion which in the Latina style of temple building is completely compressed. And so you will see a number of squished compressed amlakas in between on the spire. They will mark different stories of the temple. And so the spire of this temple is one, two, three and four, four stories tall. As we saw, a number of Buddhist ideas of controlling space through an axis marked by a column, having a capital on top here in the form of an amlaka, having a multi-storied palace clothe, cloak, enclose this kind of axis, this multi-storied palace taking the form of a temple spire and being completely compressed, make up elements of a temple. But Temple plans also grow in complexity over time. And that is because just like the Sadashiva or the Samlaji, Shiva and Vishnu respectively, the temple also needs to now manifest itself on all sides. The Bhadras or the side projections of a temple grow more and more elaborate over time. These will follow well-proportioned grids. It is not that you can expand temple plans in haphazard ways in any directions. There are constructional grids which are conformed to. There are grids of two types and those are dictated by the proportions of the wall thicknesses and the sanctum. 